we'll get started. Okay, so um, welcome to the eighth webinar in the Social Leadership Series by Julian Stodd. Thank you for joining us. It's great to have you with us today. Um, today, Julian's going to, to be building on the last webinar's theme of reputation. And Julian's going to be guiding us through authority. Um, just before we start though, a couple of quick housekeeping points, if I may. The first is that um, if you have any comments or questions today, uh, then feel free to use the Q&A or the chat feature. I know some of you have already. Uh, we'll pick those up as we're going through, or if not, at the end of the session, there should be a little bit of time to address those questions. Uh, and briefly, for your diaries, the next session will be starting the 1st of August at 3 p.m. BST. And during that session, Julian will be walking us through co-creation in the webinar. And finally, from me today, um, this session is being recorded. Uh, and then a few days after the, the webinar is finished, uh, we'll be in touch with a link of how you can view this again if you want to catch up or if you think someone else might benefit from, from it, you're welcome to share the video link with them. So as I said, that's it from me and I'll hand you over to the man of the hour, Julian Stodd. Hey, thank you. Good, can you hear me all right? Loud and clear. Good, okay, excellent. Well, hello everyone. Uh, thanks for joining from wherever in the world you are. It's a spectacularly sunny day down here on the south coast. So if I'm looking a little washed out, uh, it's because the room behind me is flooded with sunlight and my desk lamp has uh, just fused so I can't uh, light myself from the front. But let me just bring up my presentation if I can. Here we go. Okay, so here we are. We're going to talk about uh, authority in social leadership, or perhaps um, more accurately, I'll say social authority. Um, and why social authority? But, well, really because this is the, the authority granted to us by the, the community itself. So this is part of a series of webinars exploring aspects of the social age, um, this new world that we live in a world which is seeing the promotion of socially moderated forms of expertise and power, and is often seeing the erosion of formal aspects of power and control. So perhaps we can contextualize this exploration of social leadership um, in that space. As organizations feel uh, that formal power diminishing, how can they build a new balance? It probably is a new balance between formal and social aspects of the organization. Now, Sam mentioned this is one of a, a series of webinars, so I, I'm trying to share um, this piece at the start just to allow us to, to ground ourselves where we are in, in, the, uh, in the work. We're on uh, webinar 8 of 12, uh, 1 to 7 are available um, online. It, this follows the structure of the uh, net model of social leadership, which, um, which I shared in the handbook. Um, taking us from curation through to collaboration and then you'll see at the start i've just um put in a couple of foundation pieces and at the end actually you're put in the 12th webinar which will be stories of a practice looking at social leadership in different parts of the world in different contexts so that's where we are we're on social authority it's probably particularly um important to to share this one this time around because the uh, space between number seven and number eight, between reputation and social authority, is really the location of social leadership, I think. Um, everything up to this point is about um, earning reputation within our communities. So a social leader will choose their space, will, um, will work hard to add signal into a system rather than just noise. They will strive for fairness uh, and equality. They will think about the stories that they're sharing and create space for people to respond. But if they get all that right, they will earn reputation. Um, when reputation is tipped into action, um, it powers our social authority. So um, whilst I represent social leadership as a, as a circle and as a, a sort of holistic uh, type of power, um, I would say that this link between reputation and social authority is particularly important. And then when we look at the things after this, um, co-creation, collaboration, and social capital, they all really relate to things we can do once we have that high social authority. Now, 
Um, I'm draw I've drawn most of the slides today uh, from the, uh, the my new book, which is on the first hundred days of social leadership. Um, so it's the first time I'm sharing many of these. So kind of back to my uh, previous slide here, you'll say I've said this is a working out loud kind of session uh, because some of these slides are the, are the first time I've presented around them. Uh, I hope you'll forgive me if I uh, find my way uh, through the narrative a bit, you know, because uh, as part of storytelling is finding uh, a narrative. So I'm very much doing that with uh, with this work. Um, the 100 day journey is really right down to practical level as well of how we build social leadership. So I'm going to think about that a little bit as well today, not the sort of aspiration of the organization, but down at the individual level, what do we actually do to to become a social leader? Well, let's sort of start, I guess, by thinking about authority itself. Um, I guess the three things I'd say about social authority is it's awarded to us by the community and again this takes us down to some of the foundational definitions of social leadership um, if I'm pushed for a, a quick answer I, I normally say formal authority is that which is given to us by the organization and social leadership is that which is awarded to us by our community now of course you can have both so your organization may give you great formal power and your community may grant you great social power. Um, so it's, it's not beyond the realms of imagination to have both. Indeed, I would argue that every formal leader should work hard to earn social authority. But of course, the crucial context of the social age is that anybody can earn social authority. So not only if the organization doesn't give me formal authority, but if it actively doesn't want me to have any kind of authority, I can still earn social authority precisely because it's, it's, it's from the community itself. In fact, a little later on, we'll touch upon different types of social authority, including sort of subversive and negative aspects of it, because it, it, it's, um, you know, it's like technology, it's not inherently good. Um, it just means uh, an authority which is given to us from a different source. So um, back to that point of reputation, it's founded on reputation earned through actions over time. So again, a crucial piece about social authority is that you can't buy it. You can't be given it by the organization. Um, you have to earn it through the community. Hence, you have to understand where your community is. Because, uh, of course, the community that awards you social authority may not be the core community of the organization. If we looked, for example, in the National Health Service um, at whistleblowers who, um, who share stories of malpractice, very often the community that gives them their authority is actually outside the formal structure of the organization. Indeed, somebody who is a whistleblower who's exposing poor practice may inherently be bullied or disenfranchised by the, the formal structure of the organization. And you know, social authority is that mechanism of social leadership. So it's social authority that powers our, our social leadership. So this um, slide is probably, it's probably six months old now. I, I, I drew this uh, as I was starting the final stretch of work, which I think I'm still somewhere in the middle of, uh, to complete the change handbook. So looking at uh, how organizations change. And I used this to tease out and um, represent the twin aspects of the organization. Uh, whilst it's, it's, it, I guess it's a very simple notion, it was uh, quite a shift in my own thinking about this to realise that our job isn't to make the formal organisation stronger. Many formal organisations are perfectly good already or at least know how to, to get there. Really in the social age we have to recognise this parallel structure of the organisation, the social structure. So to be really explicit, I think organisations of the past focused entirely on the formal structure and organisations of the future, what I would call a socially dynamic organisation, will focus on both. But it will recognise that it only owns and controls the formal structure. The social structure is entirely under the control of the social community. It's, it's united by bonds of reputation and bonds of trust. And, and trust is um, very much on my mind today because I've just uh, a couple of hours ago just delivered the first 
uh, webinar sharing results from the landscape of trust research, which uh, I'm in the middle of at the moment, looking at where does that trust sit in the organisation. It doesn't really sit in contracts, it doesn't sit in formal structures, it sits within that social community. So that's the dynamic tension that we're interested in between the formal structure and the social structure. So, you know, what does the, the formal system give us? Well, you know, the formal system is held in these bonds of power. So social authority doesn't exist in this space. In this space, your formal authority um, rules the day. Um, but parallel to this are these um, bonds of trust. And crucially, you'll see that whilst um, in, in my rather simplistic representation, uh, formal power is held in these kind of vertical and horizontal uh, structured pathways, the reputational power of social authority can be held diagonally um, because the relationships here are, are personal ones. So they may be uh, people who've worked together in previous jobs, people whose children go to the same school, people who are in professional bodies, uh, people who just happen to share an interest in something. The other sort of key part of this, and I've, I've not represented it in this diagram, is typically in an organisation, there is only one formal structure. It might be that uh, if we looked at a military structure, for example, it can be reconfigured quite fast. So you can deploy a team or you can uh, set up a working group. So there is some flex within the formal structure, but typically we could consider it to be one dimensional in that it, or, you know, it's a sort of digital state, it's one thing or it's another thing. The social structure is multi-layered and contextual. So there isn't just one overlay of bonds of trust. There are multiple, possibly conflicting, and almost certainly invisible um, social systems um, within the organization. So I may know you in one context in one way, but I know you at the same time in another context in another way. So um, the, the whole formal structure is entangled in this complex web of contextual, multi-layered um, social structures. That's why I only drew one layer, because if I'd drawn them all, it would look like, uh, look like spaghetti. Uh, if, you, if you're particularly interested in that, if you look back to the webinar on community, um, or if you look on the blog, uh, or, or just search for community, you'll find um, a, a series of, of articles and illustrations around that because a core skill of social leaders is the ability to identify these communities, to, uh, to, to be able to recognise them, to have permission to take part in them, sometimes to actually start these communities and sometimes to leave these communities. So here we are, this illustration is actually from the, the handbook. Um, and it looks at three key things that we should do around social authority. One is to understand it, to locate where our social authority exists. One is to learn how to exercise it, because exercising formal authority is, is reasonably straightforward, um, because the power of formal authority is embedded in our formal role. So it is given to us fully formed. Um, exercising social authority might be a little bit more um something we have to learn you know how do we exercise that authority through permission through consensus hence the third point which is the humility of social leadership i i, I quite often um outside this context talk about you know social leadership is leadership with humility and this specifically is why because if you started to try to exercise your social authority with no regard for the community, you would be stripped of that social authority. It requires a humility to earn it, and it requires a humility in exercising it. And this is one of the interesting contexts of social leadership, that if I say historically, I mean even up till very recently, uh, we tended to have a view of types of power, that there were these kind of macho, testosterone-driven, aggressive sales, type of hierarchical behaviors you know strong behaviors and then there were these softer skills i mean we talked about that soft skills as if they were somehow ephemeral secondary you know if you were really up against the wall which one would you need we had this sort of mindset that you needed the hard skills well in the social age when community is coming to the fore 
I would argue that many of the uh, what we would have called social uh, uh, skills uh, or the softer skills have actually become harder if you stick with that language. It's hard to be an effective leader unless you have social authority, unless you are respected, um, unless your reputation supports you. So that's part of the context of social leadership, which um, I see many organisations sort of missing. They understand that they need to look at different types of authority, but they miss the context, which is robbing the old types of authority of some of their power. So, you know, this notion of humility, uh, I'm not going to be a fantastic social leader if I think I've landed fully formed, you know, if I think I'm there already, if I have everything I want. Um, usually, if I'm working with a group, I, 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 the thing I say is, what you have at the moment is probably 50% of what you need. So what you have at the moment has let you get where you are, uh, and you may well be fantastic within the formal system. But to move into the future, as we build a socially dynamic organisation, we probably need to relinquish this notion that we have everything and demonstrate that humility, that willingness to, to learn. And, you know, what is humility? It might, might sound like an odd question to ask, but it's, um, you know, at a practical level, um, it, it, it's obviously got to consist of fairness and tolerance. Um, uh, probably something particularly relevant in the in the UK this week as we uh, celebrate uh, Pride uh, Week. I think it's whole Pride Week this uh, uh, this year. Um, but it's certainly about action without reward, or, or perhaps I should say explicitly without reciprocity in the minute. So it's not a transactional type of action. It's um, it's just an action to support others in uh, in their own success. This. I was a little bit torn as I was pulling together uh, the slides today because I talked a little bit last month about authority um, in social leadership. And I'm going to come back again to talk about authority because, um, uh, excuse me, authenticity, sorry, talk about authenticity because authenticity is um, certainly at the heart of this piece. How authentic are you in your action? It's crucial to earn reputation to be authentic in action. And in the execution of our social authority, we also need that authenticity. So I'll, I'll come back on to that a little bit in a minute. But first, let me just uh, again look back to the context of social leadership. So are we adv advocating that um, we need social leadership and nothing else? Well, you know, absolutely not. So in that slide I shared earlier, showing the dynamic tension uh, both those words are important. It's a dynamic sort of power and it exists in tension. So we can do some things with our social power alone. Uh, social power is, is like the WD-40 of, of power, you know, it gets into other places, it seeps through the system, it will unblock things. But it's not enough just to have social authority. Or perhaps I should say explicitly, it's not enough if you want to achieve effect um, at scale and in breadth through the organisation. Uh, but neither, you know, would I argue, is it enough to have formal power alone? Because formal power typically allows us to achieve effect at scale, so we can leverage and move the formal parts of the organisation. But we kind of need both. Um, we need the formal and social uh, power to, to have true social authority. But um, I, I specifically wanted to address um, th this sort of question of uh, when social authority fails, because um, it is interesting. I get asked quite a lot at the moment about examples of, of failure. And I, I guess that the two obvious places one has to look is that social authority in some ways is the type of power that we see behind insurgency and, uh, and much conflict in the world. Um, because many uh, terrorist organisations are operating not in a formal hierarchy of power. They're operating with a type of authority which is really held um, by their community in a, in a rather perverse way. So even the notion of terrorism um, really indicates where that power sits. So it doesn't sit in a humility, it sits in a fear. And yet 
uh, it's still a type of, it's still a reputation and it's still a type of authority. Um, and much the same as social authority uh, in an organization, the socially held authority of insurgency or terrorism also cannot be removed by the formal system. So uh, I hope you can sort of see where I'm, I'm getting at with this. Uh, if you work in an organization and you have high social authority and the organization wants you to stop influencing people it can do nothing about it it can't remove your social authority the only thing it can do is limit your formal authority and control formal parts of the system so for example it could stop you sending emails uh, it could even fire you from a job but strangely enough firing someone from a job doesn't mean they lose their social authority they may remain engaged and connected to everybody that still works there and they simply become a thorn in your side from outside the organization. So if you look at someone like uh, Julian Assange, um, he is a, a great thorn in the side of uh, the uh, American government, and yet they are utterly unable to remove his social authority. In fact, an interesting thing about when organizations try to remove the social authority of individuals, they can actually end up empowering and amplifying their reputation and that's a strange thing if you're interested in that if you look on the uh blog i don't think i've i've included the slides uh today um you look at uh, the writing under the heading of types of power which explicitly references that so social authority um you know can be good can be bad uh, when we when do we see it fail within organizations well uh, moving, sort of reeling ourselves back a bit from um, terrorism, uh, with the most obvious places we see it are in failed cultures and cultures of bullying or homophobia or sexism, um, which can be at the extreme end of things. So, you know, clearly there are what we tend to call toxic cultures. And if you look at a toxic culture, uh, the clues are probably in, in the title itself. It's not particularly toxic because the paint on the walls is is full of lead or because the furniture is unpleasant it's toxic because of the culture and culture is co-created exists between individuals um, how does it exist between individuals well we influence each other in the execution of culture or i i should say in the um experience of culture so the, the way i typically describe this is if if you join an organization and you, uh, you know, you're based in an office with 12 people. If at the end of the day, everybody leaves all their mugs on the uh, table and leaves their rubbish strewn across the, the, their desks, um, you may well start doing that because that's the culture which is created uh, within the organization. However, if everybody uh, cleans up assiduously at the end of the day, um, you are more likely to clean up because that kind of peer pressure um, or perhaps we should say that kind of lived experience of culture tends to um, flow. And the reason it flows, the reason it uh, subsumes us is because if you are the person who leaves banana skins lying around on the, on the boardroom table, um, there's a social consequence for that action. You'll be judged by your peers and colleagues. Even if there's no formal sanction, you may come to be regarded as somehow um, a negative influence on culture. But these subtle cultural effects are really the same cultural effects that sit behind failed cultures. So if we scale that up away from a, just a, a banana skin left lying around up to the institutional failure of culture. So if we looked at perhaps some of the banks and their behaviors, um, you typically find it's much the same effect so the sort of interesting thing about culture when it fails is culture is not like the tide. It's not a level flat force that is either, you know, deep or shallow. What it tends to happen is it, it fractures vertically. So um, if you interview in organizations which have significant cultural challenges, people invariably view that the culture is strong within their social group. So within their immediate team within the people that they respect, the people that they give authority to, um, but they typically can describe other parts of the organization 
where culture is weak. So people can often see the fracture of culture. But interestingly, they rarely locate it in themselves. It's invariably located in other people. And this is the challenge. This is why you can't go into a failed culture and, and actually spot where the single point of failure is because it flows between and amongst those teams. So what do we see when social authority fails? We may see bullying. We will almost certainly see the silencing of weak voices. So even if, um, even if we don't see outright bullying, the, execu the, the experience sorry, of um, failed social authority can often be a silencing of quiet voices. And why is that important? Well, because if you look at a socially dynamic organization or an innovative organization, they are typically ones which have an ability to hear those weak voices within the system. So it, 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 we're, we're in the sort of space of engine tuning here, I guess. You can run an organization with no social authority, or you can probably run an organization with a toxic culture but can you evolve the organization? Can you be agile? Can you be innovative? Uh, I would argue not. You know, for that, you need an invested type of culture. You need high trust in leadership and you need uh, high trust networks flowing through peers and colleagues. So the failure of social authority is, is quite a significant challenge. So, you know, how do we uh, how do we know where we are? <laughs> you know, there's no uh, simple uh, mechanism for measuring social authority. Bear in mind that it, it sits in these social communities which can be invisible, can be, can be hidden. We, uh, we kind of need this, this, this machine to let us measure it. Well, you know, let's think back to what is the experience of social authority. Well, you know, community is an interesting um, facet of the social age. Uh, in, in fact, when I'm sort of pushed to describe in only a few short words what the social age is about. I usually say it's a time of great change, it sees an evolved nature of work, and it sees the rise of communities. So I'd, I'd, I'd really put community as one of the core foundational principles of, of the social age. And why do I say that? Well, because historically, you know, when I grew up in a village, that was my community. I only really had one community. But now, of course, I have dozens and dozens of communities typically held in online spaces typically virtual but united around shared passions shared interests shared concerns uh, connected through technology I've only met a, a small fraction of my communities in real life so what how will we you know how will we measure if social authority is high well probably because I will have access to multiple of the, multiple communities um, and I'll be attuned to that community. So being attuned to community is a good measure of social authority. And how will you know? Well, I, I was having a really interesting conversation with a pretty good leader in a, a pharmaceutical company a, a couple of months ago. And she was, um, she, she really wanted to be attuned to her community. And, and her mechanism for doing so was to recruit somebody uh, so to recruit an assistant who could go out and take part in all of these online conversations and spaces and then report back to her what was being said. Now, that was sort of interesting because I, I said to her, you know, well, that's what we call a spy. You know, you can't just send an agent into the communities to listen in there and then glean market intelligence from it. Another client I'm working with a really good organization so good people doing good things but we're very interested in their ability to um, deploy uh, an AI into their um, social communities into the chat forums to analyze all the conversations and to tease the meaning out from it well again that's really tricky because we know from the research about trust that people don't trust formal technology as much as they trust social technology but, uh, and in fact you can measure it it's about 30 percent less so for example if you're chatting if we were having a chat in whatsapp we may trust that space because we own that space we know it's encrypted end to end we know we control who's in it and we can kick people out of it um, but if we were having the same conversation 
on a, a Yammer system or a, a Slack implementation inside an organization, we may trust the space less. Now, if we discover that the organization is using an AI to carry out semantic analysis of the text of the chatter that's in there, even if they're well intentioned, because they were saying, we're just too busy to read all the conversations, you know, we can do it with technology. Well, that's really tricky. You're liable to erode the trust of the community. It's very noticeable to me that there are two types of organizations. There are those who rely on technology and often struggle to get engagement. And there are those who nurture community and are often just immersed in engagement. You know, they, they, they find all sorts of conversations taking place. So being attuned to our community is a key thing, but we can't outsource that. We can't buy a piece of technology to do it. And we certainly can't delegate it to the intern. You know, we need to be attuned ourselves. So we earn our social authority and then we are engaged in our in our community. How else will we know if we have high social authority? Well, perhaps um, by the, the, the notion of how many helping hands there are out there. Um, actually, I'm just amused now I see this slide. I remember one of the very first blog posts I ever wrote was about how I was unable to draw hands. And it turns out I'm still unable to draw hands, but you know, perhaps I, I don't worry about it so much anymore. Uh, but helping hands, you know, how will we know if we, are, if we have high social authority? because people will reach out to us. And why will they reach out to us? Because in those high functioning communities, we will be surrounded by other people with a humility in their execution of leadership. They will be reaching out to us to help because they care about us. It's an interesting um, thing I noticed when I first worked with uh, Google, I, I found I was surrounded by people reaching out to, um, to help. And the first time it happened, I thought it, I was just dealing with a nice person. And then the second time I thought that's another nice person. And then after I'd worked with them for a while, I realized it's because it was in the culture of the organization to do that. Um, so, you know, that can be a positive spin. It's not to say of course, that that culture and others like it don't have their problems. Um, in fact, what we sometimes find with highly coherent cultures is they can be extremely helpful as long as you are within a sphere of reference which is acceptable to everybody. So some of the very high functioning cultures, which you typically see in those tech teenagers, can be very inclusive and very supportive, unless you just happen to tip off the edge of the cliff. So uh, older constrained cultures can just tend to be negative and unsupportive and very hard to get moving. High functioning, socially dynamic cultures can be very supportive, very permissive, as long as you're within a broad um, space of cultural coherence. But it's a good measure, you know, helping hands, how much support do I feel around me? And how able do I feel to reach out to help others? So um, another measure of social authority, um, I, I think this one's valid. I'm, I'm willing to be challenged on it, but um, I think inspiration is quite a, a good one. You know, if we were looking at an organization, I use this exercise in, in the book to say, who inspires you? You know, does anyone in your organization inspire you? Because if they do, it's probably, you know, they've probably got high social authority. Uh, I mean, there might be exceptions. You might find people who have some deep technical uh, capability who inspire you. Uh, even if uh, you know, even if they're not particularly nice person or very helpful, but um, I, I'm, I'm willing to chance it at this stage. I think if we feel that either our organisation as a whole or individuals around us are inspirational in some way, then we're probably seeing something of that flow of, of, of social authority because we're learning about them, we're hearing about them, and crucially, we're we're able to engage with them in in some way. Now. Um, I put this one in this slide, uh, which may uh, not immediately be apparent uh, what it represents. It, it's about um, relationship versus transaction. And I put it in there because um, you may have heard me say earlier that social authority isn't transactional. It's a relationship based. And broadly speaking, that's true. Although um, I have been playing with the notion that um, social authority can probably be held in what I'm calling wise transactions. So I think that it's okay um, 
for some social authority to be held in transactional kind of arrangements. So I may say, I would uh, love it if you can support me in this way, and perhaps I can support you in that way. Um, so I may be, you know, again, I'm willing to be part of working out loud is, is, is being willing to change your mind or be proved wrong. Um, but I, I feel that's quite kind of important. Why is transacting? Um, so not just needs based transacting, but um, a wise type of transacting may actually be a valid part of, of social authority. So um, action without expectation of reciprocity a humility to, to help others within your community without any expectation of return, um, I think certainly is. I think wise transacting as well may be part of social authority, but I think straight functional transacting probably isn't. So, um, you know, just me saying, I've got 10 things on your list. If you do these uh, three things, I'll do those three things. Um, probably isn't, <laughs> but maybe, uh, maybe I'm burying myself in, in nuance here because these, of course, are all of a scale. But it's worth thinking about, um, especially when you get down to that practical level of, well, what, you know, what does it actually mean? How does it work in practice? Um, certainly, amplification is a feature of social authority. And again, um, I'll, if you'll forgive me for, um, for, for referring you back to some of the previous work or, or some of the writing online, uh, I talk about amplification in two specific contexts. One is about storytelling. So if we tell stories that are timely and relevant and um, are magnetic, then they will be amplified through the community. And amplification is a feature of social systems, plain and simple. Um, in fact, that's why uh, President Trump in the US is able to exert so much networked power is precisely because if he says something, it will be rapidly amplified through the community. And in fact, the reason why he exerts a social authority is it won't just be amplified through the community by people that love him. It will be amplified through the community by people that hate him. But nonetheless, it is amplified. Uh, uh, so amplification is a feature of social authority, either for good or for bad. Um, it's a feature of storytelling itself. So, you know, how will we know if we've got social authority? Or how will we know if others in the organization have social authority? Well, probably because we will see the amplification of stories. How will we know um, if the leaders in our organization um, are, having, are contributing to amplification? It will be if they are able to retell stories, so to put a context around them. So the act of interpretation and if you're interested in that, look back to the, the storytelling work. Um, interpretation is a key part of individual social leadership. So taking a story and interpreting it to be relevant for, for others around you. Now, I mentioned authenticity earlier, and although I talked about this in the webinar on reputation the other month, I'm gonna just sort of drop it in here uh, again um, for two reasons. Uh, not least because I, I, I'm not entirely sure I, I, I uh, covered it very well last time. So uh, I, I uh, thought I'd just put this slide in here because reputation is an interesting piece. Um, sorry, I can't, I can't seem to say the word authenticity today. Authenticity is an interesting piece. Authenticity is, um, I'm representing it like the tree here because I think it's, it's kind of grown typically over time. Um, it's often held in stories, but it's held in stories which are deemed to be authentic. So um, lived experience can contribute to authenticity. Um, wiseness, wisdom uh, can contribute to authenticity if it's that sort of lived experience um, and wisdom. So why am I coming back to authenticity? Well, um, it's something to do with this. Great storytelling almost certainly is going to take place on a foundation of authenticity. So authenticity is a, a kind of foundation piece. Great storytelling is a core skill of social leadership. So if we have high authenticity in our, in our actions, um, and authenticity is expressed through actions, and we uh, become strong at storytelling, and I, I don't just mean storytelling but also listening and responding to stories then um, we're likely to grow uh, stronger social authority 
In fact, quite interestingly, uh, in one of the organizations I'm working with, we were able to interview at scale around two and a half thousand people around core capabilities of social leadership. So what did they see as being the most desirable attributes of social leadership? What did they want their leaders to have? And authenticity uh, came top of that list. They wanted authentic leadership. So um, why not give people what they want? You know, if we are authentic in our actions, it sounds like we're likely to be given a uh, greater social authority. And then if I sort of work forward through the model, what does this give us? Well, it gives us reputation. And uh, I'm kind of uh, sharing this, this slide again because that, this notion, reputation is not a spotlight that we hold that we shine onto ourselves. It's a, it's a spotlight which is shone onto us by other people. So it's also, it's, it's not just shone by one person, it's held broadly within community, hence why I'm kind of showing it in this way. Reputation is imposed upon us because um, it's, it's, not, uh, it's not a single linear thing. In fact, um, I was talking about this with someone the other day, uh, we should always view reputation as a work in progress. Um, some things that we do enhance our reputation and some things that we do will damage or erode our reputation. And that's kind of always the case. You don't just build a reputation and stick it in a box and the job is done. Um, we are always going to be carrying out actions which somehow inhibit or enhance our reputation. So probably, as with many of these things, it's mindset that counts. If we understand that, if we understand the mechanism by which reputation is held, then we can just seek to tip the balance. And as with many of these things, it's, it's a marginal gain which counts. So if on balance we do more things that enhance our reputation than detract from it, we're probably winning. Um, uh, again, forgive me for sharing lots of stories today, but it, 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 we, I've been talking about this in line with innovation. There, there are two approaches you can take to innovation. You can rely on radical innovation. You know, are you going to have the idea for the next iPhone or, or Segway? Well, you know, maybe you are, but that's the long shot. It's a long bet that you're going to um, have radical innovation take place. The other type of innovation is that of incremental gains broadly and in breadth at depth throughout and across the organization. The ability to innovate ever so slightly in the everyday. That's a pretty good bet, because if you can embed that, then the organization as a whole is able to just incrementally move forward. Reputation is kind of like that at breadth and in depth if you are able on the whole to gradually build reputation then that's a pretty deep foundation and it will it will put up with the odd knock so um, I did mention earlier and I, I, I forgot I had the slide in here you know the types of power it's a little bit um, nerdy this uh, slide and it comes out of uh, some work uh, I've been doing around the military around um, resilience and types of power and it looks at these three sources individual power that I held myself hierarchical power which is embedded in the system and networked power which is that which is held um, within our community so social authority sits firmly in this networked power uh, whilst hierarchical authority uh, funnily enough sits within the hierarchical power structure and this is really why they are fundamentally different types of power and of course why they fundamentally come into conflict with each other so uh, I, I think this for me anyway this represents much of the challenge organizations face but an organization can have vast hierarchical power it can have the ability to impose any kind of sanction upon you to control any aspect of what you do and yet it can utterly fail to impact on your network power and authority. Um, perversely, the opposite isn't true. If you have massively high network power, you can most likely fully subvert a formal hierarchical system. I mean, really, network power is the mechanism by which governments are brought down or by which um, organizations are, are brought to their knees. Uh, organizations that have a, a hubris to rely on their size and scale and history uh, may well be brought down by networked types of power and authority which hold them to account. 
um, I mean, it's very much that is that nature. Social authority can always hold formal authority to account. Formal authority can never fully silence social authority because it simply can't reach there. And even if it does reach into one layer, social authority is multi-layered and contextual. Um, and this is one of the frustrations I have with um, measurement. And, you know, at heart, I am a scientist, so I believe in measuring. Um, and I also believe there's nothing that you can't measure. Uh, and yet, um, when you go into an organization and they say, well, can we do some kind of network analysis? You know, for sure you can do network analysis. I can show you the tools, we can plot it all out, we can draw all the graphs. You can carry out some fantastically uh, sophisticated network analysis, mapping all the connections, mapping all the conversations. And you can delude yourself uh, with impunity because, of course, you're just mapping out the scene conversations. Today, um, one of the, the key aspects of the social age is that connectivity is fully democratized. So you can map all of my connections and all of my conversations on your organizational infrastructure. But the chances are that many of the conversations and connections I'm having are flowing around the edge of that. So we in, end up with this imperfect picture. And there is such a thing as, uh, you know, imperfect data. Uh, so you can end up sort of with something that looks very pretty, that looks highly convincing and is of virtually no use to you whatsoever. Our challenge isn't to um, visualize these flows of power. Our challenge is to engage in it. In fact, I'm just reading a, a very interesting book at the moment around um, the evolution of systems of measurement and bureaucracy. And it, it talks about how, um, how our desire to measure and our ability to measure has often been used as a feature of the formal system to reinforce its own power and authority. So before I used to be able to measure an hour of time, I couldn't sell an hour of time. But now that I can sell an hour of time, it's used to hold me within a, a system of selling my time. Um, so all of that really is the, the futility of trying to measure it, but we do need to understand if these different types of power um, exist. And then, I think I've used this uh, slide in, in the last two or three webinars because I, because I quite like it because it speaks inherently of the, uh, of the way that uh, information flows within organization. It's the battling of stories, formal stories and social stories and the response of stories. These things slug it out for power within the organization. We often find organizations fire stories out. They're the sort of artillery of credibility. Um, Whilst, in fact, if we really want to become socially dynamic and if we have high social authority, we have to stop firing stories out and make them magnetic. You know, we have to provide spaces for people to engage and we have to have the humility to listen to other um, interpretations of, of stories. So let me uh, just uh, start to wrap this up to think about where are we, you know, wh where are we on this journey? Well, this is the, the, the model of um, social leadership. And I'll, I'll just run through it again because I find it, it helps to contextualize it. You know, as a social leader, we choose our space. What will we be known for? It's so our foundation is to take an active consideration of what our space will be and to then curate our messages, our stories, our content around that. We become expert storytellers and listeners. So we interpret and make relevant the stories that we share to other people. And we share them to add to the signal rather than to add more noise. That's the first part of the social leadership model. It's our foundations. So by the time we get to this stage, we've actively chosen a space and we have become wise storytellers, understanding how stories work and flow. In the next piece about engagement, we understand the organization, the multiple communities we're in, from the fully social to the fully formal, the role that we take with each one, the type of power that we have with each one, and whether we need to start a community or leave a community. On that basis, we can choose which, which communities to be engaged in and how, and by wisely sharing our stories and, and supporting others, we earn our reputation. And that takes us to where we are today, this tipping point of reputation into social authority. And we've talked about that social authority. But where does that get us when we have social authority? Well, this is what we'll move into exploring um, in the next session, is about 
co-creation. So co-creation is about the sense-making capability of communities. And, and I really like that phrase, sense-making capability, because that's really what our communities do. They help us to figure stuff out. Sometimes we're an active participant in that sense-making, and sometimes we're just a grateful recipient of that sense-making. But nonetheless, those um, mechanisms of social filtering and moderation are what give communities their, their value. So understanding co-creation is important. And as social leaders, being able to access the co-creative power of a community is extremely valuable. Social capital is our ability to survive or thrive in this space. So as an individual social leader, earning my reputation, I need high social capital. I have to, I have to learn how to grow my social capital, but crucially, I help others to have it as well. This notion of helping others, of putting others first, of fairness, of equality and humility um, is extremely important. And with all of that in place, we can collaborate. We can collaborate widely and wisely uh, because we have these foundations in place. So that's the model. We're, we're two thirds of the way through that. Um, in the next session, which Sam, as Sam said, is uh, at the beginning of August, uh, we're going to talk about co-creation. You know, we'll look at that in some detail, understanding co-creation. Um, uh, just to let you know that my, uh, my next book, which is on um, social leadership, my first 100 days, will we'll launch on the 10th of July, uh, which is very exciting. It's a 100 day journey uh, through this topic. Um, if you're interested in trust, um, you might like this. Uh, if you haven't already, and I'm afraid I, I don't know if uh, anyone here has, but if you haven't taken part in the landscape of trust research, please um, uh, have a look on the website and, and find your way to that. The uh, landscape of trust research is, is a, a large quantitative study of this. So we're analyzing stores of trust. And uh, next month, I'll also be publishing the trust sketchbook exploring um, aspects of uh, of trust so that's an exciting project so that is uh that's our, our pass through social authority and uh i uh i see that uh <laughs> maxine i'm still thinking too it's uh it's a constant uh, thinking out loud uh for me but that takes us to the end of this uh, uh this uh session so uh, i'll hand back to sam see if we've got any uh, any questions or thoughts well, first, Julian, thank you for taking us through that. Very interesting. Um, and it's great to see some of the thoughts from the, the new book coming into your thinking as well. As, um, as a crewmate and colleague of yours, I've seen these ideas evolve over the over years and they continually evolve. So, Maxine, you are not alone. We are always thinking about new ideas and Julian is provoking these. Um, uh, no, I... I um... I see that uh, Maxine's mentioned Etienne Wenger. Now, this is, this is one of my favourite stories. Maxine, I can't remember if I've ever shared this before, um, then uh, please stop me. But uh, I, I have a certain fondness for um, the work uh, that uh, has been done uh, by, by the two of the... Uh, I, I think I have to say Wenger, don't I? You, you, I I'm going to embarrass myself with my pronunciation. Um, but thank you, <laughs> yeah, Wenger. Um, so I had the weird, the absolutely strangest introduction to their work. I'm willing to bet it's the strangest introduction of anybody to their work. So I'd never heard of them at this point. I was on a train to London, and I was illustrating for the blog. As you, uh, you probably know, you know, I, I, I illustrate the blog every day. And sat opposite me was a was a young girl who was also illustrating, and she was drawing pictures of trees in a book. And we got chatting. Uh, around about Winchester on the train and um, I don't know if anybody here is from the UK or the US or anywhere else in the world so it's, uh, it's a very traditional home counties of England and um, and she, she she just started sharing this uh, these sort of thoughts about communities and drawing trees and she did this wonderful little story um, talking about uh, communities and and drawing as she went so she illustrated sort of out loud as she was talking and um, she said, oh, and then she was asking me about what I did and I explained it. And she said, oh, you, you'll love the work that my parents do. Um, and uh, so it was their daughter uh, who I just bumped 
into it on the train. So she sort of gave me the email address and put me in touch. And that was how I came across their work. Now, I, I don't actually know how many children they have, but I'm thinking not that many. So, <laughs> I, yeah, I found it quite a, a coincidence that I, I, I through, through drawing on the train, both of us drawing on the train, we kind of, I was connected into their work which is a very long answer to the question. Uh, yes, I think there's, um, I think there's certainly a, a connection to the, uh, the work that they uh, did early on and, um, you know, continue to do. Uh, so uh, very, uh, very interesting. It's a, it's a good connection. <laughs> so anyway, that was a detail. So <laughs> we've, uh, if there are any, uh, any other questions or, Maybe if not, um, I will send an email out after this just to uh, link you in with a couple of articles, uh, a couple of bits of writing around that and link you into the Explorer uh, community. If you're not already part of that, then uh, do, do uh, stay in touch. Uh, if you've not taken part in the landscape of trust research, then uh, you know, please do because it's, it's crowdsourced research. The more people uh, we get, the stronger it will be. I'll stick a link uh, from that in the uh, email as well. So uh, over to you, Sam. Thank you very much, Julian. Uh, and in addition to that information, we'll also, as I mentioned at the beginning, uh, send a video link out to you. So if you do want to recap on anything Julian's talked about or want to share that with anybody you think would be interested, then please feel free to do so. Um, we hope to be back uh, in a month, 1st of August, 3 p.m. BST, British Summer Time, to talk about co-creation. But between now and then, uh, I'll just thank you again for, for joining us today. Thank you very much for giving us your time. You. Uh, and thank you again to Julian for taking us through a really interesting topic. Great. Thanks, everybody. Okay. Bye.